All right, something different. Yeah, another ancient piece of technology to amuse the graybeards in the crowd. First clue is the last time this thing was shipped anywhere was in October 1999. That's upside down. You can figure that out. Um, the description on the end of the box says it's a DigiChannel 8 port serial I.O. board used in a TechNow and Message Master devices. Let's just haul it out of here. I'm guessing this thing probably hasn't seen the light of day in decades. Uh, here it is in all its glory. So what we have here is an ISA computer board, uh, which is an eight port serial port device. So back in the day, most computers could address two or four serial ports. They'd have them in hardware, usually only two an internal plugged in modem would give you another one. But this one will give you up to eight and it's got a big brother, which can do up to 16, which is kind of cool. Now this is from a company called Digi Inc. Or no, sorry, Digi International. Founded in 1985 in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Strange place for a tech company, but whatever. Uh, so this particular board, the information that I could find looking it up, and actually I found a manual online with some searching, and the manual has a copyright date of 1994. So I don't know whether that's for the for the revision A, this particular one is a revision L, a relatively high serial number. Um, but doing a bit of Googling around on the part number here, uh, 30,354, actually found some people talking about it. Um, so let's, uh, I guess, first of all, um, so this thing came out of the scrap bin of a paging company. It was, as you saw, a spare, uh, which hadn't been put into service. Um, and from the manual, you can see that there's just a ton of configure. Oh, just from looking at it, you can see there's a ton of configuration. But we can break it down fairly easily. So it's got eight serial ports that come out here. Um, standard RS-232 ports, although obviously you need a fan out cable. So the eight serial ports, um, there's some parameter settings on these eight, eight position dip switches here, uh, to tell it what port number it is and a few other things. And then the 10 position one, according to the manual is I O port address for interrupt status lines. The old timers in the audience will remember the pain in the ass of setting up interrupt uh, interrupts for hardware devices in ancient computers of the day back when ISA ports were a common thing. Uh, but that's not the only place you have to mess with interrupts. These jumpers up here and these jumpers down here are also for interrupt. Uh, what does it say? Jumpers for setting up the actual IRQ lines and the board ID. So without the manual and a whole bunch of head scratching and incantations and phone calls to the manufacturer or more likely calls to the manufacturer's BBS. Yes, the number is in the manual. No, it probably doesn't still work. Um, eventually you'd be able to get this thing set up, but since this particular one was a spare card, no doubt you just copy the settings of the existing one, put it in, cross your fingers and cross your eyes and hope for the best. Other things I noted in the manual, these two plugs up here, where are we? There we go, in the top corner. Right now they're just set for standalone, but you could actually daisy chain multiples of these things in a computer. Can you imagine a computer case with a bunch of these beasts and that big cable hanging off the back of it? Wow. So the, I think I mentioned it briefly. The actual use that this thing was for was in a box called a Technow Alpha, Alpha Paging Concentrator. Basically, you'd hang a shitload of modems off the back of it, uh, and your customers would dial in with their modems 
to send text-based uh, pages to ye old pocket pagers. Um, I'm s assuming that uh, BBS, precursor to the internet service providers of the day, would also use this for their modem pools or something similar to this, uh, tied onto a bunch of modems sitting on a shelf precariously, no doubt. So what do we got inside this thing? Well, the obvious thing is these big, these eight big chips here, Texas Instruments 16C450N, which are single UARTs. Each one of those is a single UART universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. Basically, that is what buffers the parallel signal from here, turns it into a signal, and sends it out. These particular ancient ones um, specify that they do not have a first-in, first-out buffer. So that's all got to be handled in software down here. Major pain in the butt, I'm sure. The drivers must have been just magical. Um, what else is going on down here? There's these eight uh, Motorola chips in a row, uh, SN74LS688. Um, actually, I found looking at the data sheets of a lot of these things that most of this board is low-power shot key, which in the day would have been very expensive and relatively fragile. They're much better these days, uh, much more common. Um, but can you imagine if this was all high power chips, how much heat would be coming off this bastard? Anyway, so what these guys are doing, they are 8-bit comparators and they are being used to basically take a bunch of lines off these dip switches, not all of them. You can see it there if I focus properly. There's my pen. You can see two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines coming off the dip switch going up to the comparators. And each one all the way along is the same. Some of them are on the top of the board, have the traces on the top of the board. These ones over here have the trace. Uh, these guys have the traces on the bottom side of the board. Uh, and they've all got these little sill arrays, single inline package arrays of uh, pull up resistors because the data sheet notes that these guys do not have built-in pull-ups. What else is interesting? There's a whole bunch of uh, 74 series uh, logic chips all over the place uh, doing signaling and stuff. There's a bunch up here too. The other interesting chips that I found are these four, one, two, three, four, that are socketed. And actually that one too, I guess. I didn't look that one up. I probably should. Anyway, these guys are all Texas Instruments. Well, the, these aren't te TI, but TI does have a part number, similar part number. Um, this pair, TI uh, PAL16R6, and these are PAL20R6. They are all programmable array logic devices, which is why they're pluggable so that they can be unplugged, taken back to the lab or sent back to the manufacturer or whatever, and reprogrammed for different features and whatnot. Not quite EEPROM um, heavy dutiness, but uh, still reprogrammable in software nonetheless, which is pretty cool. I don't know, what else is going on on here? There's a 1.8432 megahertz clock crystal down there with its little capacitors controlling it. Um, and I'm going here, not controlling, stabilizing it. And this, uh, 74 LS, uh, 541 is probably part of the clock circuit. I would guess. Oh, there's another one right beside it. I haven't traced this. These are fine enough traces in a dual, even though it's relatively low density compared to today's stuff. The traces disappear onto the chips a lot. They're fairly skinny traces, as I think you can see here. And, of course, double-sided boards are a royal pain in the butt to trace. But just look at that layout on there. Can you imagine doing that uh, with 1990s technology to lay it out? It's very nicely laid out, very pretty. All the buses just peeling off and on almost like artwork so oh yeah there's the 
logo. Let's see if we can get in on it. So Digiboard made in the USA back when things were. Anyway, that was just a quick little peek at this thing. I thought it was interesting and uh, worthy of taking a look at. If anybody has any memory of actually using these things back in the 90s, feel free to comment below. <laughs> I'd love to hear your stories. It's amazing the people you run into on the internet and there's going to be somebody who remembers this thing. I can guarantee it. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Um, if you have any comments uh, or questions, please feel free to ask down below and I will talk to you later.